Long enough to cover the subject and short enough to keep it interesting. Welcome to Out of My League. I'm Nick Diaz. LSU, it is now reported a few hours ago, is expected to hire Bo Pelini as Coach O's new defensive coordinator. Bo Pelini was the defensive coordinator under Les Miles at LSU from 2005 to 2007. Now, for some reason, people are saying this is a terrible mistake. It's an outdated hire. Pelini's too crazy. Whatever. Okay. Let's ask this question. When has Bo Pelini failed as an assistant coach, a defensive coordinator, or a head coach? When has he failed? When, he, when has he not had some success as an assistant coach, a defensive coordinator, or a head coach? Let's look. As the defensive coordinator at LSU for three years, his defense has finished top three in total defense. You all know this. Yeah, but those were Saban's players. So, Joe Brady didn't recruit a single player on LSU's offense last year. What's your point? Well, uh, Bo Pelini, that was 15 years ago. He doesn't know how to defend spread offenses. College football in the SEC has changed since then. True. But people, he hasn't been out of coaching. It's not like he's been living under a rock. He's been a head coach in college football this entire time. As a matter of fact, as the head coach of Youngstown State, his second year, he went to the national championship game in Division II football. Pelini, as a head coach at Nebraska, they were awful before he got there. He took them 9 wins, 10 wins, 10 wins, 9 wins, 10 wins, 9 wins, and 9 wins his last year, and had a winning bowl record. You ever take a look at Nebraska since he left? He's been the best coach they've had since Tom Osborne. Well, he was fired at Nebraska. Yeah, you know why he was fired at Nebraska? Let's, let's, this is really big, okay? It's very controversial. Bo Pelini was fired at Nebraska because he was caught on tape. He was caught on tape cursing. And saying mean words. <gasps> oh. Yes. So uh, he was down. Uh, Nebraska was down against Ohio State, twenty-seven to six, I believe. And the student section all left. Well, Nebraska came back and won the game. He said in a private phone conversation with former Nebraska quarterback Tommy Frazier. He said, quote, our crowd, what a bunch of effing fair weather effers. They can all kiss my ass out the effing door because the day is effing coming now. We'll see what they can do when I'm effing gone. I'm so effing pissed off. So Pelini predicted the future of Nebraska football. Freaking Nostradamus. Sounds like a smart guy to me. All right, so there were other incidences with the referees at Nebraska. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Pelini threw his hat at a referee during the Iowa game or threw it in front of his face, and the ref gave him a 15-yard penalty. And in the post-game press conference, he called it, a quote, a chicken shit call. I don't apologize for anything I've done, end quote. Okay, so he doesn't have to talk to the refs at LSU. The head coach, Ed Orgeron, he talks to the refs. And also, he doesn't do a press, post-game press conference at LSU. The head coach does a post-game press conference. See? Problem solved. Okay, okay, but there, there was this other incident after he got fired. So this was, this was after he got fired. This was something else that was very controversial, he said. So following Bo Pelini's firing in 2014, Pelini met with his former team at a local high school to talk. Leaked audio of the meeting revealed that Coach Pelini verbally attacked the University of Nebraska administration. So he just didn't like people who fired him. Go figure. At one point, Pelini said, quote, It wasn't a surprise to me. It really wasn't. I didn't really have any relationship with the AD. The guy, you guys saw him on Sunday. The guy's a total pussy. I mean, he is. He's a, he's a total cunt. End quote. See, this was after he was fired, in a private conversation he was having with his former players. Kind of like 
Coach O saying, Roll Tide what? Bleep you? And that got leaked on accident? Okay. See, no big deal. As long as, and I don't know about you, but I don't know about you, but this is the kind of mentality I want in my defensive coordinator. But look, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, Jacob Hester, who I worked with last summer and still regularly listen to his show, I try to catch up as much as I can, and former LSU players all go on the radio, local radio, and say nothing but good things about Bo Pelini. They talk more about, if you, if you would hear them talk about the 2007 national title, you would have thought Bo Pelini was the head coach. Because in their eyes, he basically was. So look, Coach O has taken his time with this hire. This was not a rushed hire. This was a well-thought-out hire. It, they did their due diligence. It wasn't like Matt Canada, where Coach O was forced to make that hire by that administration, and he had no prior relationship with Canada. And Coach O said this on radio last week, that he's known Bo Pelini for a long time and has actually had a good relationship with him. So no personality conflict, personal relationship, admiration. Pelini also runs a 4-3 defense that is way more aggressive, which is what Coach O prefers. This is what he wants. He actually did not prefer Dave Aranda's style of a more read-and-react 3-4 defense. He obviously wasn't going to fire Dave Aranda because Dave Aranda is a really good defensive coordinator. Why get him out when the getting's good? But still, this is what he prefers. Well, he, Bo Pelini's not a good recruiter. Okay, neither is Dave Aranda. Neither was John Chavis. You have one of the greatest recruiters in the history of college football as your head coach, Coach O. It's no big deal. It's a good hire. I'm excited. It's going to be fun again. And you should have fun watching it, too. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about Zion Williamson's debut, and I will mention a little bit of the Kobe Bryant news. But first, Zion had his NBA debut this past week, and last night he had his first double-double and win against the Boston Celtics. I want to start with this, though. I find it interesting every time someone who is completely ignorant of a subject offers an opinion on the subject that they are ignorant of. Now, most of the time, it's annoying and frustrating to listen to, especially in sports, when someone doesn't know what they're talking about. Like, why don't they just hit a home run every time they're swinging the bat? Well, the man standing on the hill of dirt has something to do with it. Things like that. But sometimes, ignorance can be a good thing. It gives you an outside perspective. Sunday morning, my mom who likes sports but never watches the NBA, asked, when is Zion playing again? I said, well, 5 o'clock today. And she goes, they just played two games the past three days. I said, yeah, there's 82 games in a season. And she then responds, and here's the kicker, well, that can't be healthy to play that many games. How, How would I know which game is important also? Ding, 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 ding. Ignorance can be bliss. Zion is an unbelievable entertainment to watch. Why? Because Zion is an unbelievable athlete. Eh, true, but a lot of great athletes play in the NBA in all kinds of sports. But you know what the magic potion is for Zion fever? He cares When I watch college sports, and granted, I'm in a bubble and I'm biased because I grew up and live in a college city, you can tell it means something to them every single time. Now, look, I'm not into hyperbole or sentimentality when it comes to giving my takes on sports, but only when it makes sense. Zion's game fits college basketball. It fitted college basketball. Guys playing for a community, not stats and endorsements. And yes, I believe college athletes should get paid, and I'm not saying college basketball is perfect, but I'm not talking about that. That has nothing to do with the product. The NBA has a great product, but when it's in deep in the postseason. When my mom asked, how do you know what game is important in the NBA? Well, mom, we don't, and neither do most 
not all, but most, of the players. Except players like Zion. Coming off of an injury for several months, out of shape, Zion had to be forced off of the court in his first NBA game. That's why Zion is special to people. He cares. If you care, we care. What if I did this podcast every week acting like I wasn't enthusiastic about sports? Would you listen? Probably not. You know the real reason? You, let me t- so let me bring this back to something that LSU fans can understand a little bit better. Ben Simmons. You know the real reason why LSU fans didn't like Ben Simmons or had a sour taste in their mouth after Ben Simmons? Sure, it was disappointing they didn't have a good season, but I blame most of that on the coach. Especially in college sports, the coach matters a little bit more. The real reason LSU fans have a bitter taste in their mouth from Ben Simmons is because he acted like he didn't care. Half the time he was on the court, he would disappear. Those three letters on the front of his jersey didn't mean anything to him, even though it meant everything to the people who were in the arena watching him. Well, well, well Nick, uh, uh, he didn't even want to go to college. True. That's right. But I've been watching him in the NBA and watching people who have covered him in the NBA, and they get the same vibe for him now with the Philadelphia 76ers. There's still rumors that players don't get along with Ben Simmons, and Ben Simmons still can't shoot free throws. And why is that important? Because you can teach anyone to be good at free throws. You just have to put in the time, and you guessed it, you have to care. Kobe Bryant for example, who tragically passed away yesterday, was one of the greatest players of all time. He once blew out his Achilles tendon while getting fouled in the act of shooting. Kobe could barely stand on his feet, but he walked back to the court and said, I'm not going back into the locker room with that medical staff until after I shoot these free throws. Because he cared. It meant something to him. And Zion is the same way. All of this brings me to the point, the main point, that this could be Zion's destruction as an NBA player. Is that he cares too much? That's that's the problem? That shouldn't be a problem. And that's the real reason, the real reason, the NBA won't catch up to the NFL in ratings. No urgency. 82 games is an outdated form of entertainment for sports. There is too much stuff to do now. So what's the point? And on top of that, it's not healthy for players, especially players like Zion. And sure, Zion needs to get his weight down. Not arguing that. And sure, when he lands, he lands funny on his knees. His knees are inverted. He needs to, not getting in all the technical stuff, but he needs to strengthen his hips more. You ask my physical therapist that, he would tell you the same thing. There are mountains of YouTube videos explaining the problem with Zion. And he needs to get that fixed. I'm not doubting that. But when it comes to the culture of the NBA, when the culture of the NBA is, eh, don't care about it so much about the regular season. Or, matter of fact, even the first round of the playoffs, yeah, we know who's going to win. Yeah. Hmm. This is so painfully obvious. But very few people in NBA circles want to acknowledge this. Less is more. This is modern sports entertainment. And Zion is proof that it is unhealthy to care that much when playing a basketball game. That's not good. And that's why fans and non-fans are so drawn to Zion. Goes to show you something needs to be fixed. For the sake of Zion's career and for the sake of the NBA, shorten the regular season by a lot. Make us care again. Thanks for listening to Out of My League. If you like what you heard, be sure to like, 